Good afternoon friends and uh, welcome. We are really pleased that you are here uh, for this April panel of the City Bible Forum. Uh, and I think first of all what I'll do is uh, introduce the panel to you. Uh, on my left here we have uh, Vijay Ramanathan. Vijay is a, um, a sexuality educator, researcher uh, and therapist with a, a medical background. Uh, we also welcome Melinda tankard Reist. Uh, a Canberra author, speaker, media commentator, blogger and advocate for women and girls, and Ian Powell, uh, who is a, a theologian and Bible teacher. Um, and the other uh, participant in this conversation is you. Uh, one of the things that we want to do today is give you an opportunity to be part of this discussion. Uh, so on the screen up here, a uh, 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 mobile phone number will appear. And uh, we want to give you the opportunity via your mobile phone to text some SMSs to this uh, number. And uh, through the magic of technology, I'll see the questions and be able to, uh, to ask them of our panel. Let me assure you, this is, uh, this is entirely anonymous. And uh, uh, you know, if you feel embarrassed, you can always say, uh, I have a friend who wants to know, something like that. Uh, I'd be happy to ask those questions. In fact, we want you to really participate in this. And so I'll feed those questions through as we go. So. Um, with all that in mind, uh, let's begin. Uh, Michael Hutchins once said that anyone who says that they are not interested in sex is either dead or lying. Uh, so I want to ask our panellists, uh, in a sense, what their view of sexuality is. And Vijay, if I may, I'd like to start with you, and maybe you might help us, an obvious question perhaps in some ways, but what do we mean when we talk about sex? All right. Um, so sex could be interpreted or perceived in different terms or in different ideas in different people in different stages of their life. So for some it's about procreation, for some it's about recreation, for some it's about relationship. So sex in a, in a scientific meaning it's a cut whether it's a male or a female. But in this context what we are talking about the experience of the sexuality which is much broader than the just the act of sex. Mm. So when we mean sexuality, it's about who we are. Yes, we are, we are born and we believe you are a male or a female and how we are being socially constructed to behave as a male or a female and how we bond, the intimacy, the gender, the orientation. Yeah, of course, the pleasure is part of it. So sexuality is much broader and it's a core aspect of being human. I think that's the way to put it. Okay, great. Melinda, you spent a lot of your life looking at a, a fairly broad range of sexual issues and the way they impact especially young women. But let me ask you this question. Uh, why, is, why is sexuality so important to human beings? Why is it such a big issue for us? Mm. Well, it's really um, at the, at the centre of, of uh, our, our personhood, um, who we are, who we've been created to be. And I, I agree, I see it as... Uh, uh, you know, a core human issue. It affects so much of our lives. And I, I think the, the problem comes when it gets away from being seen as a, uh, an intimate way of, of connecting and forging bonds with other people and uh, becomes a, what I call a commercialised, commodified, industrialised, plasticised porn sex. So uh, we're getting a version of sexuality which is very much based on uh, pornography rather than uh, a deep connection and human bonding. And uh, so I think that the true kind of essence has actually been, uh, been swamped by, by toxic and harmful messages. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian, you're, uh, you're a Christian, you're a Bible teacher. I guess you're here as a sort of representative of Christian and, and sort of church views. Christians have a fairly long history or at least a reputation of fairly negative views uh, about sexuality. So I guess you're here arguing for what, sexual repression, yeah, uh, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that kind of why, where you see sex fitting into the human experience? Uh, no, I mean, one, of the, one of the reasons why I didn't want to become a Christian when I was getting persuaded that it was true was for fear of what it would do to my, the, my sexual possibilities. I was 18, 19, the idea of being a virgin or staying a virgin, or actually I wasn't, it wasn't, I won't get anyway, yeah. um, but, but being chased until I got married yes. and then only having sex, it just seemed intolerably ridiculous. Um, I am, when I became a Christian and began to study more of what God actually says about sex or what Jesus says God says about sex, I'm, it's at the very heart, as people have said here. Um, when the Bible introduces us to humans, it says only three things about us, and one of them is male and female, which is an extraordinary of only three things you say about us. Um, and the, my understanding is that when God gave us, made us sex, sexual, it's not just 
genitals and intercourse. It's the whole being of human. Apparently, every cell of my body is male except my white blood cells and either hair or fingertips, I think, fingernail, I think. And same with Melinda. Every, they could tell if it's from a woman. We're deeply sexual and it's seen to be one of the highest, most wonderful gifts that God has given us and therefore can also become one of the most painful areas when it sadly can go wrong. So we've got sexuality, which is a much broader thing than genital sex. Yeah. BJ, can we come, come to you? Um, uh, put together for us, I guess, the importance of sex in a, in a, well, in a, in a relational context. Is that where you see sex uh, operating <coughs> at, at, at its best? How do you comment on the, re the connection between relationship and sex? The bonding. Bonding. Yeah. Because I normally say to my students, the main sex organ of the body is not between the thighs, it's between the two ears. <laughs> okay. So I think that is an important aspect to understand. And sexuality is one thing, you can use it as a measure, like when a couple in a relationship, they get along very well. I think we call the period called limerence. So once they pass the two years, they start putting the priority down and they get along with other things in their life. But sexuality and sexual pleasure or bonding takes a lower order priority mm -hmm. because they get into other commitments. So it is important and sexuality is one thing that could actually help a couple build on their relationship, the general relationship, mm -hmm. but also as uh, Ian said, it could be a source of problem. Yeah, right, okay. Um, Melinda, I want to ask you a question, but before I do, let me remind you of the uh, SMS number up there. And so if there are any questions that you would like to ask, please feel free uh, to do that and I'll pass them on. Melinda, a lot of your work is to deal with the sexualization of, uh, of young girls. Before we go into to that area, can you talk about what you might see as an, I, I, a sort of more ideal, more healthy sexual expression for young women? What, what would you like to see? What, what would be something that is a very positive expression of sexuality? What would be positive would be if they were engaging in relationships that uh, actually had some, some meaning and actually uh -huh. had some connection and intimacy. I, I talk to thousands of girls a year and the stories they're telling me are, be are becoming extremely disturbing. And the way girls view their own sexuality is not in terms of their own uh, pleasure or in terms of intimacy with another person. It's how did I perform? Was I able to do what he wanted me to do? And I don't know how graphic you want me to be, but girls are telling me stories of um, going to parties on the weekend and just being expected to provide oral sex to all the boys there. And there's a, a new sort of phenomenon I'm hearing about where a girl will be put in a cupboard and just there to, uh, to pleasure the men lining up outside the cupboard. I'm getting girls telling me stories that uh, one told me, 11 year old girl said, uh, I don't want to go to the local show this year, what excuses can I use not to go to the show? Why don't you want to go to the show? Well, because all of my 11-year-old friends lost their virginity at the show and they've arranged for me to lose mine. 12-year-old uh, girls will tell me about being molested in their schools, including in Christian schools, by the boys. So they're experiencing very cold, soulless, transactional versions of sexuality, completely removed from their own enjoyment, their own pleasure. And many of them are, are being damaged as a result. And I okay, think let me hop in there. Off. Ian, uh, you worked as a chaplain in a boys' school for quite a number of years. You've been a pastor in, in, a, in a church. Um, you know, I, I guess let's focus for a while on positives rather than negatives. What, um, for you as a Christian, what would you want to see young boys, how would you want to see young boys expressing their sexuality in a positive kind of way? What, what, what's a kind of, in your, your opinion or a biblical view, a kind of ideal expression of, of sexuality? You know, what, what should it be like for human beings? In two seconds. Uh, or less. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, I mean, my hope for the boys would be that they would become fully, truly human, which means that they will be like Christ, who's the, the healthiest, fullest human who's walked the planet, in my understanding. Uh, he, he himself, as far as we know, lived as many great people have and died a virgin, and yet was fully, lived his life as a fully orbed man. Um, and a sexual being, a but sexual not being, someone yeah. who engages in sex. You write a good book on the sexual life of a nun, and it wouldn't be purient, and oh. it, would, it would just be because we, we, we do our things as male and female, and it's part of what enriches life. So I would want the, the boys to learn what it means to be a man in the way that they treat women, which is uh -huh. to use whatever strengths they have in order to love. And I think my understanding of the whole 
the whole nature of the universe, and I don't want to get too thingy here, is that you go, according to Christianity, at the heart of everything is not an not a indivisible oneness, but the Trinity, the, the Father, Son, and Spirit, at the heart of the universe is loving community. And so at the heart of human life, and I think we all know this in a sense, is loving community. And that is found in its, one of its most intense expect, you know, possibilities between a man and a woman so that they would love the woman, so that in terms of sexuality, that they would therefore follow the maker's instructions, that if you're not willing to give yourself wholly to someone, you oughtn't to give yourself wholly to them physically. Mm. And, um, and that the act of sexual intercourse, as it says in uh, the much hated and never read Apostle Paul, who says that the wife's body does not belong to her, it belongs to the husband, boo hiss, and then and, it says, yeah. and the husband's body does not belong to him, but to his wife. Yeah. So that sexuality, the meeting of sex is that I am there to serve and love the person who I'm married with and having sex with and she will respond likewise and in that we will be uh, brought to mutual pleasure with various levels of success and learning, that's part of the fun. But what's happening all the time is it's, it's all building in, it's growing from love and building in love rather than it's me and my, me and my pleasure. Okay. And if you'll get some, that's, I'd want the men to be like that. Okay, great. Let me remind you again, SMS number, bring the, the questions on. Vijay, um, Ian's, uh, I guess, tried to, to cast sexual relationships in, uh, sorry, sexuality in a kind of relational context. What do you see as a, as a sort of therapist and a researcher when you see sexuality expressed apart from relationship? What, uh, I guess we're looking at some of pain and dysfunction and so on there. What do you see? Well. Much of my answer would be in the, in the context of a therapist because as a clinician you tend to see people with problems so you always your mind is tuned about the problems they have either as an individual or as a couple but I would like to see them being comfortable with their sexuality and whatever that is that's fine. Whatever their orientation whether pleasure is important or not whether relationship is important or not I think they have to be comfortable within themselves with sexuality. I think that's one thing I really look around the issue of being comfortable with their sexuality and for being comfortable they have to have the knowledge of what is the, the facts and what is the social construction of normality because in many other uh, area it's very hard to define the problem whereas in sexuality it's very hard to define what is normal, what is the norm yeah. and where do we take the concepts of norm and that's yes. where many people feel very discomfortable with so a lot of it's to do with uh, my own expectations, where have I got those expectations from, and so on. Yeah. Melinda, is, um, this is a, a big area for you, because you talk a lot about uh, a phrase that you've used before is about calloused sexuality and uh, uh, sort of industrialised sexuality. Do you want to make some remarks about maybe the media's role in shaping those kind of expectations and where we get these ideas from? Sure, well everywhere we, we look in the media and popular culture is uh, the messages, we see the messages and imagery from the sex industry, the mainstreaming of pornographic messages in the public domain. So in the past you might have to go look, looking for pornography, now it will find you whether you want to be found or not. And so young people are being raised in this hyper-sexualised environment, they've been raised in a triple X world mm. and growing up in the shadow cast by pornography and they're getting their messages from the mainstreaming of, of pornography. We know that the average a a exposure, uh, age of exposure to porn is 11. 70% of boys have seen porn by 12 and 100% by 15. And those um, stats are coming closer to girls as well. And so we're conditioning and socialising boys everywhere in the culture to see women and girls only in terms of the sexual pleasure and sexual gratification they can provide. Girls are just reduced to basically their, their orifices, what they can provide sexually. And this is Linda, extremely I just got damaging. a question here. Yeah, can I, I saw leap that, in? the sex and power one. Oh, well, it's the other one I was going to ask you. With okay. regards to what's happening to young girls, the question is, you've asked, uh, what is the root cause of the problem? Would you push that in the area of media? Uh, well, I'm not just going to blame media. What else would you want to include in this? Well, messages about, um, about body images, about self-esteem, about values, what is, what is valuable. I mean, media plays a massive role. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Yeah. And uh, the media is spreading a, a particular view about women and girls that we have to be thin, hot and sexy to be acceptable. And younger and younger girls are now feeling this pressure. Uh, I'm being asked to do in primary schools now what I normally would do in, in high schools. And the, pre the things that were once affecting girls at 16 or 17 are now affecting them at 10, 11 and 12. Ian, I'm going to go to you with this question and we'll, the other guys leap in if you I'd want to. I'd love to have a go at that one Okay, well. well I'll start with Ian. And, <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
which is the question, why do sex and power, this is a question of SMS, why do sex and power often get mixed up together? Why do we damage each other in this area? Uh, do you, how do you respond to that, this question, the link between sex and power? Um, I think uh, I'd like to kick that along to my fellow panellists till I can think about it. Okay. So it's not an area that I think about much. Vijay, before, uh, uh, Melinda, yeah. before you kick in, Vijay, yeah. do you want to say anything about that? Well, there's a bigger issue than sex and power. It's about the gender in a society which is male dominant, then obviously sex is going to happen in that gender power dominant. So sex is one medium where the men could actually demonstrate their power. Yeah. And this is so true in third world countries and cultures like India where still it's a predominantly a male dominant society. So we need to look beyond that. But I think sex is something we can use not to just demonstrate power, it's a medium to demonstrate love and affection. If we express it positively. It positively yeah. Melinda, some comments on that from you about sex and power? Yes, again, we have to look at the culture and again the cultural messages that we, we are giving to boys. We are knocking empathy out of boys from the youngest of ages. If you have a look at some of the computer games that they are playing and the messages about violence, the overexposure to violent messages and images, teaching them that violence is sexy. I do a whole presentation on this. I show about 150 slides from the media and popular culture. And the message they get from music video clips and uh, from their computer games is that it is sexy to be violent to women. And if you listen just to some of the latest songs that are out, it's all presenting women as wanting to be brutalised, wanting to be treated badly, wanting to be beaten up, wanting to be tied up. Uh, even mainstream advertising, there was an ad recently for a real estate company that showed a woman kidnapped, tied up and bound and um, terrorised with, with weapons. And this was for a real estate company. Melinda, well, this is Australia. all happening this year. I think we just celebrated the uh, 30th anniversary of feminism, allegedly, uh, the beginning of feminism or whatever. International uh, Women's Day, yes. Yeah, so how does that connect? Well, what I argue is that uh, I believe we've gone backwards. I believe the message for women's freedom and equality has been overtaken by a message that says, um, basically, that the, the sex industry pornographic messages that says that uh, it is empowering and liberating for women to flash their breasts in public and to wrap their legs around poles and to provide oral sex at weekend parties. Girls now think that that is actually being feminist, mm. is to behave in publicly mm. sexual ways, to, that the bearing of the female flesh is what, make you, what makes you a feminist. I just had this question put to me, I did a radio interview before coming here, about people for the ethical treatment of animals, which I argue should be called people for the ethical treatment of animals but not women. Uh, they produce some of the most sexist uh, advertising. And the question put to me was, but isn't it feminist to take your clothes off to, to promote something, to promote a cause? It doesn't just show how free and liberated we are. And I think that just, you know, the pornographers have won, the sex industry has won. So you're won. actually arguing that women are more oppressed now than they were 30 years ago? I believe we're oppressed in new ways mm, that we never ways. before mm. envisioned. I think women have always been second class. I've travelled a lot, I've travelled around the world. I, you know, research, female genital mutilation, dowry, deaths, infanticide, female feticide, uh, all of the horrible things that are done to brutalise women and to oppress them. But I think what we're seeing now is a new form of oppression uh -huh. where women are being trained and conditioned to buy into it, that it's actually seen as liberating for you to act out what your oppressor wants you to do. Yeah, right. And this is the message that younger girls are imbibing. Yeah. So they think that, that they're free uh, and celebrating some kind of freedom by acting in uh, highly uh, pornographic ways in publicly. In you want to buy it? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about, if I, there's two things. One is, I, there's a strange way in which if, you, if you're a man with a poor view of women, as, as I think I was, just the sort of standard view that they're there for our fun, and you, I'm, I was slightly more a fashion because I grew up in the 60s and 70s, you still treated them well if they were nice girls. If they weren't, there were sort of two categories of women. Yes. But um, it just seems to me that somehow or other feminism, which has got a whole lot of right agendas in it, has gone tragically wrong. It's just, I just think men who like to use women have a huge debt of thanks to the way in which feminism has been distorted. I don't know if we did it deliberately or they're just accidental winners, but the whole thing I think is that what is so good I think about the whole way in which Jesus urges us and changes us to be is that the whole thing about life is, is about love, about the other person. So that the use of all power is to the service of the other. So when you come into, sec into the immediately obviously sexual, sexual intercourse between a, a husband and wife, um, it is all about the other person. And I think the thing with our society is it kind of gets that intimacy matters and you've got to be concerned about the other, but so many other messages of our society about the assertion of self yes. and that's what freedom is, and yet 
when you begin to live life in the way that Jesus reveals that God wants it, it's all about the other person and your freedom is found in loving the other and good relationships are found there and Quite that makes sense into sexual. So message. power is all about yeah. power to serve, power to love. Okay. Let's take this in a slightly different uh, direction because we have a question here for Vijay, which is really, have you noticed a, a difference culturally between India and Australia with regards to uh, sexuality, sexual expression, and so on? So whoever asked this question, thank you very much. That's my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. See, it's very hard to put a, a one point because India is also changing a lot. Yes. So we really can't say a blunt answer, yes, this is India, this is Australia. Because of globalization, things are fast changing in India. So we need to know which aspect, which time period, or which persons we are comparing. So sometimes if you look at India, the sexualization is much faster in India because of the westernization. So it's very hard uh, to differentiate. But in terms of your question, whether it's right or wrong, it's hard to say. But one of the issues that came up from the focus group is along the line of life, and in, especially in sex life, where do we put sex, the act of sex and commitment? In Indian culture, it's believed that commitment comes first and then you experience sex. Whereas here it's different, you experience sex for quite a number of time and then you get into a committed relationship. So that's one issue that came out from the focus group, which is quite interesting. Mm. And I, I do remember pastorally a, a woman when I was at my previous church in Darling Street in Balmain in Sydney, having lunch with a woman who said, I think I keep getting this wrong. I meet guys, I sleep with them and the next morning I ask myself, so do I like them? Mm. And she said, I think I'm getting it, I have an order, a sequential problem. And I'm saying, I think maybe you do. Mm. Yeah. Melinda, can I ask you a, a specific question, which is, uh, I looked on your website and, and there was quite a lot. Brave man. Uh, uh, there was quite a lot there. A big issue for you at the moment is the issue of, uh, of young girls and beauty pageants. And we're talking about very young girls. Can you just describe a little bit of, of this issue and your response to this? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, we have a, a global campaign against child beauty pageants. Uh, if any of you are familiar with toddlers and tiaras, that is coming to Australia. It's toxic. Can I just ask, has anyone yes. ever heard that expression before? Just stick your hand up. I'm just interested to know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, this is this uh, version of child beauty pageant, which is highly adultified, highly sexualized, putting girls in, uh, you know, sexualized clothing, adult type um, behaviors, being posed and styled like, like adult women, but then extreme sort of parodies of adult women because most women here don't look like Tammy Faye Backer as far as I can see. Um, <laughs> Did you want to point someone out in particular? <laughs> no, I, look, I won't go there, but the fact is that this is coming to Australia. We don't want this toxic US uh, um, child pageant culture here at all. Our girls already have enough problems. We have one in 100 girls with anorexia, one in 10 bulimic, one in four want to have cosmetic surgery. Uh, Self-hatred is already a rite mm. of passage for girls in this country. We don't want to add to that. So we're having protests around the country. We have a petition, which I would love you to sign if you go into uh, my organisation, collectiveshout.org. My colleague, Deborah Malcolm, up the back can help you. We've got a lot of literature about We're going to say something Shout. about Melinda's books in a moment, too. And then you can sign our, our, sign our petition. We're calling on Peter Garrett as Minister for Youth hmm. and uh, his Victorian counterpart, because the first one is going to be in Melbourne not just to do something to intervene, to stop this. We don't need it. It's harmful to the health and well-being of little Melinda, girls. Melinda, can I say, you know, when I looked on the website, I saw, you know, protest against beauty pageants, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I, kind of, I think I had in my mind, you know, I hope I don't say it, like Girls Brigade or Fizzy or something like that, you know? And then I actually looked at the YouTube video, and I'm thinking, Ian, do you want to tell us that story you mentioned over coffee before, just about your experience? Yeah, just briefly. I had um, three daughters, and two went to this reasonably conservative Anglican private school by accident, and the other one went to a government school. And I was surprised at the sort of conservative, it was a very good girls' school, but whenever we went to the cultural times with the girls, I'd always get there early, I'd sit down the front so I could get a good view. And I was just confronted with these little girls um, dancing, I guess like Brittany and other people like that, really sexual. And I'm thinking, do, if I don't look at them, that's rude, because it's a visual thing. But if I do look at them, um, I, which, I, which part of me wanted to? You know, It was a horrible, and I'm thinking, do the mo mostly women staff not get what sort of dancing, the message yeah. that's sending? And this was at a very conservative school that was a great school, but it was just weird, this sort of experience of watching, I felt like a, a pedophile watching. Okay, Vijay, I want to ask you this question. It's come up here. The question is, how do we determine the boundaries being right and wrong? On the one hand, what we're basically talking about here are moral issues. 
ethical issues. We're, we're saying, Melinda is saying very strongly, there are some forms of sexual expression that are wrong. You're a therapist. Uh, you work in a world, academic kind of world, where actually that language, right, wrong, uh, if I might, you know, moral, the word moral is a very dubious kind of word. Mm. Just as a person, how do you respond? Is everything okay? Like some people want to express their sexuality by watching little girls doing stuff, is that okay? Or how do you respond to that? I wouldn't say it's okay. But also when you repeatedly say it was sexual, the dance movements were sexual. So what do you mean by that? Okay, Can whether it's sensual. <laughs> no, we don't want a demonstration. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> whether it's sensual or whether it's sexual, is it our interpretation of sexual uh -huh. when their moments were just one other movement? So it's sort of there is an interface between what is shown and how we interpret as well. Yeah, right. So looking at the question between right and wrong, I always see a gray area between right and wrong. There are many issues between right and wrong. It's yeah. very hard to categorize and dichotomize this is right, this is wrong. So what is right for one particular group of people at one particular time in their life may be wrong to another group at another point in life. Say for example, in a clinical experience, if a guy watches pornography but not getting addicted to it, just watches as just a flavor or a fantasy, and maybe the couple watches together, they enjoy it, maybe fine. But if the guy, if he just in his developmental age, if he's going to watch that and takes this norm, this is what a normal sex should be, then that's where the problem starts. And we often see that. So where do you came to know that a normal sex should be this long, this many time, this many minutes you have to have, they say, pornography. But then I tend to say, can you fight like a hero in a movie? He said, no, I can't. Can you run like a hero in a movie? He can't. So then why do you believe that you have to do? The problem here is when they see pornography, the mental fragments start believing that's natural and this normal. Is, yeah. They don't understand the gene between making a film. It's fabricated. Yeah, sure. Melinda, can I go to you and ask a question? You are actually saying that there are some uh, activities, some behaviours that are both sexual and wrong which seems to me a kind of stance uh, which is very countercultural. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, look, I don't always use the term wrong. I usually Why not? use harmful. Why don't you use the term wrong? Because well, I thought that's what you were saying. Well, maybe you need to spend more time on my site oh, yeah? and buy my books. No, so you I, don't think it's wrong? OK, I don't go out there saying this is wrong because Why not? it doesn't help. Sorry, I'm just pushing you a bit. Yeah, yeah. Why, why don't you say it? It doesn't help it? the conversation. So I will talk about the evidence base of harm. I will talk about what the girls especially are telling me and what the global research is telling us about the harms of pornographic culture. So it's not just me saying it, it's the American Psychological Association, it's the UK Home Office, it's the Scottish Parliament. But you think it's wrong, don't we you? Have, I think it's wrong to harm any other person, for right. sure. And what a pornographic version of sexuality does is, is produce harm. And my, my fourth book is called Big Porn Inc. Exposing the Harms of the Global Porn Industry. And uh, we look at everything in this book, from child porn, incest porn, bestiality porn, gay porn, and its destructive impacts. And look, what we are seeing now that we weren't even seeing, say, 10 years ago, this is just to give you one small example, is a rise of child-on-child -child sexual assault. Now, in the past, when one child assaulted another child, they would look for sexual assault in the first child's background. Now the child development experts are saying, no, we can't automatically assume that that child his or herself has been molested. What they are saying, the Australian Crime Commission last year produced a report attributing the rise of child-on-child -child sexual assault to viewing of pornographic imagery, viewing of sexualised imagery, uh, which was leading children to act out in inappropriate sexual ways. So um, it is having a pornographic vision of sexuality is, is having di diabolical consequences. You know, I got a sorry, people. Linda, I've got a question here for you, uh, which is, um, Someone's asked, if I go out on the weekend uh, and meet a girl and we both want sex, what's the issue? How come you've got a problem with it? Do you have a problem How with that? I've got a problem with it. Yeah, and what's, what's the issue? What's the, what, why I, do you have a problem? It doesn't really matter if Ian Powell has a problem with it. Um, uh, I'm not an expert. My, my issue is uh, that God has, has said something very clear about that and something very wise. And I think a bit like the gambling thing, Christians really strongly opposed the opening of casinos. We were mocked. I remember the ABC mocked us. As, mm. Now they're all saying, gee, there's a problem with gambling. And no one ever goes back and says, well, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry, we uh, got it wrong. And I think, I think we're realising that, of course, Christians at times are silly and we're hung up and we make mistakes. But the general understanding that, that sexuality taken outside of loving long-term commitment is wrong and destructive. 
Uh, I think increasingly, nobody wants to say it, but people are increasingly saying when you set it free from that, you, you in the end you enslave it and destroy it. So I would say in the end, if you, if you love the person, um, you, you don't, un until you're willing to give yourself to the person financially, in all the other ways that you do, you're not ready to give yourself or to receive from them the fullness of sexual intercourse. It's a form of body language and at that point we're lying. Okay. But I think the sad thing is that our community actually believes it's right. And this is the stuff that, uh, if I may refer to it very briefly, to an article about the movie um, No Strings Attached. It had two sex, uh, sex experts speaking about it. It was about uh, sort of friends with benefits, that sort of thing. And um, I haven't seen it yet. I, I didn't want to give it my money. I'll see it when it comes out on the disc. Um, just because I feel I have to. But uh, there's a, the sex therapist was saying, one of the, they were sort of both a bit wary about it, but one of them ended up saying, you know, people, they have sex and then they get to know them and think, boy, I don't like you, as if that was normal and okay. Mm. Uh, we've, we, are, we are so sad. And I just think it's, it's not just the problem people have when they stand before God, because that it really is saying to God, shut up, you know nothing. You invented sex, you're the great sex therapist, etc. but shut up, you know nothing. Okay, and let me... The, can I, I want just to, make one quick comment about You can, but I want to ask a question that someone's asked here. Okay. The question is, uh, and it kind of comes out of that, this message that you're, you're giving is a pretty hard sell. And as parents, someone's asked, we find it very hard to convince our children that you know, watching these music videos is inappropriate or these games is inappropriate or whatever. What do we do as parents? What's a constructive thing that we can do as parents? I have two, two daughters. What, what can I do constructively in this area? Well, what's worked for me is that mine are all locked in the garage. <laughs> and I just find you've got to do I what have works thought about for you, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's worked for me. Okay. And okay. I just put food under the, the gap there and uh, everything's fine. It's all in Melinda's next book. It's okay. all in the next book. That's right. Parenting. Live from the garage. <laughs> Look, um, I think what is very, very difficult is that our role as parents is undermined at every turn. Yeah. Our attempts to raise happy, healthy, resilient children are eroded and undermined by the culture. I do agree with the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. So yes, parents, we shouldn't buy into the culture. We shouldn't buy the sexualized toys, games, clothing. Uh, we should have limits on, on computers and no computers in the bedroom, all that basic stuff. But you know, we can't turn off the billboards. Uh, there, there are things we can't control. We can't control always what happens when our children visit their friends. And the or fact when they is, walk into a shop. Or a shop, that was on the your pornography website, at children's eye level, you, you will yeah. notice next to the lollies. And these are the issues that I'm on about and Collective Shout is on about. What we do is we also call upon our regulatory bodies and our state and federal governments to take action to protect our children from this harm. It is harmful. What we are doing to our children, our young people, is harmful. And so our campaigns involve not just targeting the advertisers, corporations and marketers who exploit our children in these ways, but we also take it up to, to government and say, well, what are you going to do about it? So all of you have a vote and uh, you can do something, contact your MP, say this is what the research shows and what are you going to do about it? And if you don't do something about it, we won't vote for you next time round. So it takes a collaborative, all of community approach if we're going to see any change. And just quickly, friends with benefits, a woman said to me, how come uh, he gets all the benefits and I get none of the friendship? Yeah, yeah. Vijay, there's a question here for you and the question is, if a person is sexually, taking us in a different area, if a person is sexually abused, the emotional scars take uh, longer to heal than the physical scars, so they, the question says, does this mean that sex is more than physical? Oh, without second thinking, yes. As yeah. I told, the main sex organ is between the ears, so the scar remains there for a long time and that has implications in forming relationship. When you want to have sex with your married partner on a relationship, it reminds of you the bad experience and that could have a long toll on their general relationship and sex life and we see that quite often. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's a question here. The question reads, uh, the law allows sex at the age of 16. Why do we wait, uh, have to wait for marriage? Melinda, I might just go to you and ask, do you have any opinion about um, what, what is the impact on young people who have very early, maybe even, even relatively happy sexual experiences? Is there actually some benefit uh, in, in, in waiting until one is older before one engages in sexual activity? There absolutely is. And I can quote research out of Western Australia about three years ago, which found that the majority of girls in this country regretted their first sexual experience, which was characterised and marked by two things. The majority of girls the majority regretted their of first... Girls. In Australia, Correct. Regretted, regretted their first sexual experience. Characterised by two things, drunkenness and force. This was their first experience of sexual intimacy. The majority of girls. The majority of girls. Drunkenness and force. What a horrible way to have your first sexual experience. So that's what the girls themselves are saying. 
They wish they had waited. They wish they hadn't been coerced and pressured into unwanted sex. There is a lot of unwanted sex happening in this country and globally. So, you know, part of my work is to try to equip and empower girls to, to navigate uh, this sexual decision making and uh, recognise what it is that they really want. And when girls themselves are saying they wish they'd waited, I think we need to help them to do that. Okay. I'm going to ask for some final comments uh, from, from you guys. Um, so, um, Vijay, anything that you just want to say, maybe uh, as a general comment, summing up some of the things that we've talked about or something you didn't get a chance to say? Just, just a minute or so on that. Okay, so I think just to address the question why religious people are against sex, I think that's not true. If that's the case, we shouldn't be meeting here yeah. and talking about <laughs> it. I think it's what we are concerned, well, I'm not truly religious, but the sense is the context at which it happens, and that's the most important issue. It's not against sex. I think Hinduism has talked a lot about sex. A moral eroticism can actually lead to spiritual realization, and I think biblical wordings are again also positive about sex, but where it happens, when it happens, how it happens is really the concern. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's Linda, some final comments from you? Oh, look, I just uh, love everyone here to, to get on board with our work with uh, Collective Shout for a World Free of Sexploitation. We're only a year old, but we've had some major victories against major corporations, uh, Woolworths, uh, Calvin Klein, uh, Harvey Norman, Meyer, Bonds, etc. And uh, we are really taking this fight uh, up to advertisers, corporations and marketers uh, here and we've been asked to do it globally as well. We've had uh, some major victories that have been reported internationally. We got all of the Calvin Klein uh, simulated uh, gang rape billboards taken down. You may have seen those in Sydney before they were taken down. And so we're starting a, you know, a, a grassroots campaigning movement to try to harness the concerns around objectification of women and sexualization of girls. You know, we need whole well-rounded citizens of the world, uh, not um, girls that are forced to conform to normative and stereotype views of what it is to be female and uh, who are engaging in uh, meaningless sexual hookups that actually harm them physically, mentally and spiritually. And uh, so I'd love you to, to, I just had to throw in a plug there, uh, to, to get on board with what we're doing. I'd love that. I was interested in, uh, on the website, uh, the, the, the Rivers uh, campaign. I remember buying rivers, you know, I think it's clothing made for middle-aged men, you know, and, and quite rightly, some of the advertising, which I hadn't well, Dead said, women under a couch. Dead, dead women, under, women a couch. under a couch. But I can report to you, as of yesterday, we won that. We have yeah. won that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. rivers, that uh, ad has been uh, criticised by the Advertising Standards Board as, uh, you know, inappropriate objectifying women and glamorising violence against women. And just yesterday, we had a win against Good rivers. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Ian, final comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to get a chance, if, if you're able to come back over the next weeks, to look at systematically at some of the stuff the Bible says. I think the, sh the shame is that the gross um, damage that we've done to sexuality, so even with those figures about girls, I think that the fact is a lot of girls think, well, that's, that's just normal, it's painful, but it's worth it. It's just, we've normalised the sadness yes. and um, we've trivialised sexuality. I think the, 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 the thing that I found surprising and is absolutely true about, about God and sex is it's his idea, it wasn't Hugh Hefner's idea, it's certainly not the devil's idea. He made us sexual. The, geographically, in the middle of the Bible is a, is a book of erotic love poetry. I used to love reading it to the boys at shore. And it, because it's Hebrew love poetry, and it's poetry, rather than just pornography, it's between a young man and his wife, and they're not saying, my goodness, I, I love your mind. <laughs> you know, she describes what a fantastic body he has and how much she loves kissing him. He describes what a gorgeous body, how much he loves her breasts and how much he likes kissing her. Geographically, in the middle of the Bible, is erotic love poetry, the seal section in a sense. And I think the, the only way to enjoy sex in all its fullness or to recover from various damages that, that we get into with it is, is this, the God who made sex and okay. who is... There's no one who values it more and knows more about it. Um, so... I just think it's, it's this wonderful gift from God. It enriches life whether you're single or married. Um, and it's, it's um, you know, he's absolutely in favour of it. Okay, a few closing comments. Uh, Melinda has a number of books on the back table. I'll just mention one. This is called uh, Getting Real, about the uh, increasing sexualisation of girls. Uh, you can buy that book. I think it's $32. There's other material on the back table of hers. Her new book comes out, we think, in September, uh, and so we're looking forward to that. So if you're interested in that, that uh, topic, get the book or go to the website, which is Collective Shout. If you Google that, you'll get that. And my own website, Or put in Melinda's name, and you'll find that on Google. A couple of other things. Uh, Ian, as he just mentioned, is going to be speaking on the topic of, uh, of sex over the next three weeks. If you're interested in that, that's in your pack. There's also a feedback form. We'd love it if you could fill that in and let us know. Uh, 
um, comments, questions, whatever, hand it in at the door. If there are some personal issues that this has raised for you, maybe some of the stuff that Melinda has talked about or whatever, fill that in. We could maybe get some help for you if you think that was appropriate. And finally, on your behalf, uh, how about we thank uh, the panellists for their time. Thank you very much.